Good morning, everyone. Welcome to MWC Third Day. Uh, my name is Travis Wittevin. I'm the CEO of Avira, and I want to talk a little bit about smart home security. Actually, we'll actually take a dive into my smart home a little bit later in the presentation, and I'll just show you what I've learned and discovered about what's happening in my network. So, I mean, as you can see by this trade show, everything is digitizing. In one way or another, all aspects of your life are becoming online. For so many years already, we've been buying, shopping, learning, banking, travel bookings. Everything we've been doing has become more and more digital. And of course, what we're seeing now is that next evolution in digitalization, where all the devices that are becoming digital. So whether it's my car, my lighting system, my door locks, my speakers, my heating system, all these things are starting to connect and they all have applications and purposes that are becoming part of this entire digital world. And when I think about all those things that I'm doing, shopping, banking, surfing, learning, socializing, and all those things that I have, I can imagine that my world is getting quite complicated. And even when the world was simpler, so when it was just computers and laptops and, and tablets even, we could call the past, we started to understand that amount of security and we can see that it's still overwhelming today. Malware still exists, ransomware is still at large, people are still getting hacked on those traditional devices. Now when you add that extra layer of IoT devices, those new systems, that explosion is starting to occur. The amount of capabilities for someone to do something bad is growing. The amount of capabilities where a vulnerability or a mistake happens in my infrastructure is growing. And that threat growth is something actually really significant and we already see it happening today. We've already seen some of these threats occurring already today. And when we look at this home that's getting connected, many people don't even realize they have a smart home. Very often when I ask, how many people have a smart home? Actually, there's a few of you here. How many have a smart home today? See, none of you guys are raising your hand. One, two raises their hand. How many of you have a, an internet connected TV, a Samsung or an LG? All of a sudden, it's usually 60, 70% raise their hand. I'm sorry, but you have a smart home. You have a device in your house that's communicating on the internet. And that device is really interesting. So we'll take a look at it a little bit later, but each one of these devices communicate, and they might not do the communication you think they are doing. I was just talking to one of my colleagues. I was really surprised. I have a, a Google Home in my office. I'm not there today uh, or yesterday when I, when I saw the alert. I, nobody was in there, not even my daughter was in there. And it was speaking to Philips Hue servers. Interesting, I don't have Philips Hue in my house. So why was Google Home talking to Philips when nobody was there and I don't even have that product in my offering in my portfolio of products that I have in my house. So all these devices are things that we need to think about and they're all talking, they're all communicating and they're all doing something that I might not be aware of. So let me give you, I'll show you what my house network looks like. So this is my basement. These aren't the IoT devices. This is just my house and if you, if you look, it's my internet router, it's my door alarm system, and it's a bunch of cables going into different rooms in the house. This is my lighting, my gate, my gate system. This is my door entrance system. Um, and these are just a couple of the things. So actually, from an IP perspective, so communicating in the internet, this is just one, two, three, my DVR system, three, four devices that are actually talking from my basement. But in my house, I have 29 devices that are talking on the internet. Because I have the Sono speakers, I have the TVs, I have my iPads and iPhones, which I can't forget about. I have other products like Google Home and Alexa that are in the house communicating on the net. And what's really interesting as a, as a call it an experimental homeowner, you get really quickly into a, a level of technology and complexity that's that even for me, it's actually sometimes hard to manage and understand. And I think very much often, or I think very often about my father-in-law. He's 86, he has a smart TV, he already has a video camera by his front door, and all of a sudden he's confronted with, and this is something that I'm confronted with too, an application, oops, an application for everything. 
this is only a subset of the applications we have in my house, but he has to go into a different app, a different download, a different menu, a different user interface to manage those devices. Very often the updates or firmware updates as we know in the tech industry are notified through those applications. He never goes in there, he doesn't look at them. He, it's too much already, it's too overwhelming. And yes, people can say we have things like uh, Apple HomeKit or other type of consolidating apps, but they're all horrible. You can't use them. In daily life, not all the products work with them. They're not really built for easy use yet. We're still in this low level. So not only do we have the digitalization of what I do, the digitalization of the devices that I have in my home, the complexity that each device has a different application and service that it's running, and you can see sort of the variable that's occurring means I'm actually incapable as an individual of protecting my infrastructure. It's just not possible. On top of the level of complexity that my home is adding, uh, two years ago I did a bit of an experiment about it connecting me. So I have my Garmin Wi-Fi enabled watch, I have my Wi-Thing scale, I have my temperature thermometer from Wi-Things from Nokia that's connected. And I also have, of course, my banking and all these other things that are happening in my home all the time and, and transacting in my home. So Avira, about three years ago, set off in the journey to say, how do we protect the wild west of smart home technologies today? How do we figure out all that complexity and bring it down to a point where we can at least tell the user, you're safe? So you, of course, start thinking about what that means. And so what we started out in the journey, we said, okay, everybody has a router at home. We most likely can figure out a way that we can install software on the existing infrastructure. So one of the router protocols is something called WRT, OpenWRT. That's the operating system or the programming code that's on the router. We built our applications for WRT, which means you could go onto TP-Link, you could go onto D-Link, you could go onto many different devices that ISPs and telcos and service providers are delivering to their customers. Sad part is, they sit there the first time and say, where's the money? If we do this, if we bring security to the home, how do I make a business model? So we're working with them and you start seeing the announcements happening that they're learning that they can actually make a business model out of it. But it wasn't bringing really smart home security to the home. It's gonna take another six months, nine months, one year, two years before that comes. And as you remember, 70% of you raise your hand, you have a smart TV. So, what we did now is we said we have to come out with our own product and we will now in Q2 ship our own product that connects into your network and basically it has to do a few different things. So one, it has to, it has to detect what you even have. Many people don't know what they have connected in their networks. It gets really complex. My daughter is 12. She loves playing games. So she has now spun up game servers in her, in her, in her MacBook and she gets VPN connections to her friends and they're dialing in and playing off the game servers that she spun up on their network. They, she gave VPN access to our entire home. These things I don't even know it's happening. If I didn't see it on my router, I would not have known she gave access to all her friends to our home network. So it gets a bit more complex with children. But in any event, so I have to figure out what's happening on my network, who's there, where is it going? I also have to understand what's normal behavior. So those devices that are in my network, they all have a certain behavioral pattern. A camera sends a stream of video. It sends it to a certain IP address. It does a certain thing with it. These are things that I have to understand because once I understand behavior, I can understand when something unusual is happening. So that's important. Assess the risk. Many devices out there have already known vulnerabilities. Weak passwords, bad programming, and other problems to be addressed. But how do I, as a user, get that information? Well, if we can identify the device, we can access certain information from the device, we can actually proactively tell you, you need to do an update on that device to be secure. So that's an important part. Device agnostic. Because these devices, the little camera that's from Xiaomi that's in my house, or um, the Y-Thing scale, I can't install software on them. So it has to be on the network level which adds some complexity to the story, but it means that I can't be on the device. I have to assume I'm not able to be installed on the device. And then, of course, understanding of who talks to who, and where, and why, and what are they sending. And then, an important part of the whole equation, because the amount of devices that are coming into the net is so vast, so many manufacturers, I can only understand what's new in the network and identify it new by using 
the leverage of all of our users. So Avira has about 500 million computers worldwide that we're protecting. We have about 40 to 50 million active homes on our network every day. And through that, we are able to identify new systems, new devices. We're also able, though, to identify behavioral patterns that are typical or atypical for what's happening in your home. So I'll give you a little bit of a picture. Here's a subset. So uh, a subset of some of the devices in our lab as well as in my home. It's not perfectly my home. A few things are. I don't have a Philips Hue, um, but that's it from our labs that we had. But you see that we have all these different types of devices, and they all do really funny things. So Amazon Echo, when you install an Amazon Echo, the first thing it does is it finds out what do you have in your network. So it scans, packages it, installs it, and sends it upward. So Amazon now knows everything that I have in my home. Amazon does it actually pretty clever, though, because Amazon only sells, sends data to Amazon servers. Not all other products are this clever. So the Samsung TV is a different story altogether. And so what I see is, of course, all my products that I have running in my network, their IP addresses, how we categorize them, what they are. This is my pool system. These are just some screenshots, but actually I do have an oven as well uh, that's connected to the internet. And each one of these have a purpose, which is good. It's important. But each one of these are vulnerable. And when you do IoT security for the smart home, you have a really big challenge. Your challenge has to be to stop that which is undesired and to allow that what it's supposed to do. Because the last thing you want to do is if something happens on your door lock system, you shut down the door lock system, and all of a sudden I can't enter my house anymore. In this, in this world of security, there's an extra layer of complexity that we need to deal with because actually the purpose has to be allowed. It's only the threat we want to carve out and block. And if we go further into the devices in, in the home, and maybe some of you recognize some of those devices, it's really, it, it grows faster than you can imagine. Whether it's network storage devices, whether it's media devices, or any of the other home automation tools. And these things all have different behaviors, patterns. And funny enough, most of these things are under $100 or 100 euros in value. So one of the things you have to ask yourself as well is, if I buy a product from a manufacturer, my Xiaomi camera was $32. So I buy a $32 product, I put it in my home to protect the garage area from if something breaks in that it detects it. How long is Xiaomi willing to manage, update, and maintain that device for $32? They have maybe a 10% margin on it, so that means they're making somewhere around $3. Um, are they gonna have a team working on it for three or four years? I mean, I don't really wanna exchange all my devices every three, four years. Okay, I've learned a little bit on the mobile phone side, I do that, but my, the rest of my home, I don't wanna do that with. Especially my oven, my dishwasher, I don't wanna change them all. So let's look at some of the traffic. So when you see a device, it has certain behavior patterns over the course of a month, a day. It sends certain protocols to certain servers and you get an idea of traffic. For a normal user, this is really irrelevant information, but traffic can tell you a lot. Where something is talking to, how often is it talking, how much is it talking, all this stuff is in traffic visible. So I can't maybe see what it's saying, but I can know that it's talking. And so this is something interesting about traffic. But what I also do with traffic is I recognize what's there. And once I recognize what's there, oh, this is a device X, this is a device Y, we actually can go in our database and start looking at, when we find these devices, what do we find on them? Oh, we found that there is a basic admin credentials on a device. Oh, we know that it's certain, talking on certain ports that it shouldn't need to talk about. So we as a technology can discover behavior that, or allowances that shouldn't be tolerated or allowed. And then of course we can block it. And to give you an example, it's something like a door lock. A door lock should not video stream, right? Simple, logical thing. A door lock should speak to my central locking computer or the door lock service in the cloud that I use. And if it doesn't do that and it starts doing something else, that's weird and I probably don't want it. And so you know by the type of device and the communication it has, what's okay, what's not okay. Same thing with Philip Hughes lights shouldn't actually be scanning my network and talking to my TVs. Why would my lighting system talk to my TV? 
they don't have a relationship, there's nothing they should be doing together. And these are things that I, of course, want to prevent from happening. And so when we see these things happen, and when we see these things come up, we can actually automate a response. And what I mentioned to you before, most users who have these smart homes, they don't know. So I show here a manual blocking or a manual isolating of a device. But basically, the purpose is just to show what's possible. You can block a device. You can isolate a device. You can block just a port or an attack type. We do this automatically. So we basically say, this is the purpose. It's a Xiaomi camera. It does video streaming to the Xiaomi cloud. That's the only thing it should do. All this other traffic, I prevent from happening to it. And when it tries to connect to those ad networks, I also stop it from connecting to those ad networks. And I only allow it to talk this much traffic every day, every month. And these are the things that we do automatically. And these are the things that we will show the user that we've done so they can go in and change. But at the end of the day, that's part of the home security concept, to take that complexity away. And so at the end of the day, it's not just about somebody hacking me, but it's also about my privacy and the fact that I actually don't know what's going on in my network. Because my network at home has become sort of a, a point of importance in my life that I can't ignore. Right? When I first installed our lighting system, um, we have an app on your iPhone that controls a lot of the lights. And downstairs, I don't have any light switches. It's only via the app. And the challenge was that learning curve so when I left to go on a trip to San Francisco, my wife, of course, called me and said, I can't turn on the downstairs lights. These are things that are happening. And this was on, by accident that I didn't teach her right or it didn't work well. But can you imagine if it was something that happened like a hack? How do we react? So we need to take these things out of it. So that's an important part of this whole story as well. And the privacy part, like I mentioned before, it's actually a big issue. So, just to give you a little bit of an introduction of the topic, a little bit of color to what's happening in the smart home world, do you have any questions that I can maybe answer? No? So um, just to give you a, a one piece on the Samsung TV, I thought it was quite interesting. I mentioned Amazon does it really well. So Amazon bundles all the information and sends it to Amazon servers. What they do once it hits their servers, you don't know. Right? It could be anything that they're sending out. I do know that the Alexa scans my network. So Alexa is collecting everything about every device I have at home on a regular basis and putting it into this Amazon package that goes home. The Samsung TV does it opposite. The Samsung TV tells you everybody it's talking to, and it talks to everybody. Right? So my Samsung TV is currently right now talking to 35 different servers in the world. It's talking to uh, subscription streaming services that I don't have a subscription for. It's talking to Google Analytics servers. It's talking to uh, ComTouch advertising servers. It is communicating everything directly. So you could say they do it wrong, right? They should hide this from me. But actually, it's good that they do it. But it's actually bad at the same time, because they show the problem. And when you look into some of these business models, and it, this is not related to Samsung, but some other devices, they're actually getting money from companies to send that information to them. So they're subsidizing the cost of that smart device that you put in your home based on the cell of information about you and how you live in your home that you're living in. So there's really, really interesting things going on. And Avira, smart, Avira Safe Things is actually trying to prevent that smart home from breaking, from destroying your privacy, and from maintaining security. So, and thank you very much. And I'm glad I could share a little bit about what we do with you. <laughs>